Public Space Travel is a leftist, anti-capitalist podcast of disgruntled academics, video gamers, and friends. Our belief is that knowledge should be made more accessible and be used for anti-oppression and non-hierarchical revolutionary ends. You can support what we do at patreon.com forward slash public space travel and reach out to us at publicspacetravel at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 208-502-1406. Now, on to the show. Welcome, everybody, to this edition of the Weekly Warp. Today is Sunday, August 30th. We have a nice, fun discussion ahead of you for today. We got a good episode here today. We're going to get into stuff. We have um, uh, Koa with us today. Very excited, special guest. Uh, Koa, uh, father of many children, as you may remember. (laughs) Uh, We also have Lazarus, of course. Hello. And uh, shadow producer Marx is in the building, in the shadows, um, as his name suggests. First, uh, I'm going to throw it over to Lazarus. He's going to kick things off. All right, folks. This week has been another week of mental, physical, and emotional exhaustion. There is the continued and intensifying COVID-19 pandemic, wildfires and storms, more states state-sanctioned murder by police, which led to yet more police brutality, and a teenager wannabe cop committing murder at a Black Lives Matter protest under the nose and with seemingly complicity by the law enforcement officers who watched on. All of this in addition to the continued farce of American electoralism with the Republican National Convention, aka an overt fascism circle jerk containing a purse commercial and a firework finish. So, RNC has really been just pretty much renamed as the COVID Fest 2020. Uh, (laughs) And specifically, of the hundreds gathered to watch the final night's speech, many were neither wearing masks nor following the CDC guidelines. According to a Truth Out article by Chris Walker titled, White House Official Spurns COVID-19 Prevention, Everybody is Going to Catch This, CNN reporter Jim Acosta had asked a senior White House correspondent about concerns for so many without masks. The response from the senior White House correspondent was, quote, everybody is going to catch this thing eventually. The article does go on to say that during the entire time, the entirety of the RNC over those four days, uh, more people had died from COVID-19 than did during September 11th. COVID's here. It's here to stay. It's really... You know, it's. I, I want to ask the uh, the White House correspondent, um, or, or, or I want to be there to tell him like this isn't Pokemon. We aren't supposed to catch them all. We are supposed oh, to <laughs> all have this. <laughs> what are you talking about? We were talking a little bit before the episode and sharing, uh, I guess, the different areas and either the response or lack of response or whatnot of this COVID-19 pandemic and folks, it's, you know, it's still a scary presence. It's something that when I was watching the RNC and I spent a little too much time, I think, watching this RNC, uh, I think the intention really was to provide a image of normalcy Mm -hmm. that everything's fine. We don't need to wear masks. We don't need to sit six feet apart. We can sit shoulder to shoulder because America, but there's still a pandemic raging on top of everything that's going on. Yeah, I, I, what, what was it? There was like maybe two speakers, Melania included, who made any mention towards COVID-19 or the victims of it. The rest of it was just America good, socialism bad. It's, it's also, it's, it's interesting because the whole thing is obviously that's all like a big Trump, uh, palooza. And it's like his whole platform is, not about what he's going to do for the country, but just like, trust me, I'm not a bad person <laughs> and I deserve this. Like, you know, put, putting all of his token uh, black friends and, and Latino friends like that he's probably gave him money to, putting them like out front just to be like, look, I have this one friend. Like, how can you call me a racist? This doesn't make sense. Uh, like, so the whole platform just is not about 
policies are actually affecting people besides you know what he said which was you know putting uh americans on the moon i believe that's part of his uh platform actually <laughs> i think he said that 2021 americans are going to be on uh oh, not on, the moon, uh, on mars is oh yeah mars that's it because yeah. that's, like, that's uh, what we all were looking for that's <laughs> like that's that's reminding me of like the was it Newt Gingrich who said we got to put American colonies on the moon like moon bases. But anyway, uh, I guess I'll kind of open this up to the whole crew here today. Um, I'm like personally really interested in the educational, like the learning aspect of you know DNC and RNC, you know, like specifically in terms of not only the image portrayed but the rhetoric used. I'm curious what maybe y'all's thoughts are about that. Like what is being taught? through the spectacle that of mm. these different conventions we can focus on you know either one or whatnot but it's an interesting question i i mean obviously american exceptionalism i think that is also literally in the trump campaign like if you go on his website one of his platforms is we will teach american exceptionalism to every student i'm not sure how you phrase this but it's I, I saw a lot of Republicans on Twitter that were like, oh, it's just nice that it's not all doom and gloom. Like the DNC is all like, this is bad. And it's all just so wasn't negative. It, wasn't it all doom and gloom? I mean, because it was all like the enemy, the enemy, the enemy. Right. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's just preferential doom and gloom, I guess. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh -oh. <laughs> you know, but, uh, like... Because they they buy into the idea that like the leftists and progressives and liberals all they want to do is just talk about how bad America is, as we sit here in a podcast talking about how bad America is. <laughs> uh, Touche. <laughs> they got us. Checkmate. They got us. I would. I would. This is actually this is it. This is the last episode. <laughs> <laughs> we have to stop. <laughs> I don't know what they're teaching so much as what they're just saying. Like, I, I've been kind of like one this weird, I've been feeling like it's, um, oh, I can't even talk today. Nothing new has been said. It feels like everyone already kind of like has their minds made up about how they feel about Republicans or how they feel about Democrats or leftists or socialists. Like it doesn't seem like there's a lot of room for nuance or an actual conversation about what's going on in this country. So I don't feel like they were teaching anything so much as they were just reinforcing the propaganda, uh, mm. that anything that is not Republican is basically like not only anti-American, but also basically a terrorist. I think that speaks to and anybody jump in, but like, I think that this speaks to, uh, it was definitely the further solidifying and justifying, but solidifying of like the hegemony of what's going on, uh, specifically like Western civilization. You know, this is a threat to Western civilization. It's a, uh, here is our history. And of course it's a very whitewashed colonizer, you know, history that they're going to talk greatly about these like white uh, United president, United States presidents and so forth. Uh, overlooking the genocide of Native Americans, the you know slavery and so forth, I, for me that that really stuck out. Uh, whenever they talk about the Republican Party as the party of Lincoln, and Lincoln was the one to, you know, Emancipation Proclamation, like all that stuff. Like, it's just a very interesting, like ideological, like cultural war going on right now of portraying who as what. Yeah, and it's always who is the enemy. And so forth. I don't There's know. Oh, do you have any? Thought? Oh, go ahead. I was to say, Koa, do you have any 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 thoughts on on all, on this? Um, I think for me, in regards to uh, what they're trying to teach, both sides actually, the DNC, you know, utilizing all those Republicans to say, mm -hmm. hey, look, you know, like like not only is not only do um, liberal people support Biden, but we have all these um, Republicans who also hate. Trump and believe that he's bad for the country. And then of course, Trump counters by, you know, bringing on a Democrat or two who are, are you know, are, are, are um, people of color to come in and be like, hey, look, we have a black friend and I have a Latino friend and, 
you know, all these people like me too. And so see, like, and so there's a lot of this, um, this, and I, I, I kind of wonder, like, is it good that the Republican, former even Trump staffers are not just supporting Biden, but jumping in in the fray in regards to like, uh, was, is it the Lincoln Project? Those former Republican mm-hmm. yeah. who are who are you know doing those commercials that are very much a Republican style hit job on Trump. Mm-hmm. And I kind of you know part of me likes it, but part of me is like, is it really? Is it yeah. adding to the message of the of Biden or just liberalism in general? Is it making us? It's going to be making it more even more toxic in regards to this uh, movement of change that we we hope to have instead of being a real movement it becomes kind of in a sense like co-opted by the republicans <laughs> you know it's mm-hmm. like it's almost a it's like an eternal a civil war between republicans right now and biden is the, the the head of you know of the republicans who want trump out <laughs> yeah so is that interesting B- biden is the republican leader that um that they need not the one they asked for <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting that you mentioned that because I, I, I do think that's like totally spot on. I, I'll have to look into this and we'll probably talk about it in a future episode, but I saw that Cornell West and was it Nina Turner are looking into creating like a new third party, a people's party. I'll have to look into that some more, but it'd be interesting kind of, I think people are getting more and more fed up of like this very divisive way of politics that's going on and has been going on. Yeah. I mean, like, I I feel like at this point, like, if, like, the um the argument for Medicare for all is, is like a a moral argument. Like, to be against it is is immoral at this point, in my mind, and and probably a lot of other people's minds. And it seems, the DNC sort of, not outwardly supporting that, like, kind of giving, verbal, like, oh, we'll consider that type of talk. I think that, like, what what I think is like when I watch the the some of the RNC and I watched the end of Trump's speech. Uh, what I caught was him saying, "I want every children, I want every child in America to know that they can achieve whatever they want to achieve," which was boring. But I was like, people are going to go, "Yeah, see how positive he is," um, you know, like he just wants to be so uplifting to all the people. And uh, he also, I believe he followed it, uh, followed that with, or just before it talked about how our ancestors, when they f- first arrived on this, uh, on this land and they were brave enough to move West and, oh, and that like, was yeah, he's, he kept saying our ancestors, our ancestors are like, these are not my ancestors. <laughs> Who are yeah. you talking about? Talk, are you talking about also, the genocide of yes. <laughs> indigenous people? Yeah, totally. Like that was, yeah, that was like that whitewashed colonizer bullshit that I, as soon as he said that, I was like. I, I think the, the point I was trying to make was, was I, after I watched that, I actually got so upset at the DNC because I was in my mind, like people, there are people who love this type of rhetoric and aren't interested in really like doing the research and you know i think like the polls continuously showed that at least trump always has like a 40 percent like solid base like hold on the country and it's just like the fact that the that there was a presidential candidate who actually spoke for the people and had massive support uh i'm talking about sanders and like the dnc just kind of it just there was an actual opposition towards Trump, and now we have this situation where people are on the fence still at this point. Like with all that's happened, coronavirus, 180,000 plus deaths, uh, the Portland protests, like the all this stuff, and people are still on the fence because because Biden is not interesting, and they knew that, but they didn't care because he got, serves their interests. And I just got so upset that I was like, we might. Trump might win and I feel like it might be the DNC's fault because at least the RNC is sort of like consistent with their messaging and consistent in being able to rile up their base their horde (laughs) like 
and the DNC just it's like sort of like yeah continues to create divisions amongst I don't know like pe people who they would want to you know like they want to shame into voting for Biden or you know you can't you have to vote for Biden because otherwise Trump will like it's just like they love the fact that they can just say that if you don't vote for Biden then you're basically voting for Trump. I don't know. I'm I'm throwing a lot of generalizations out generalizations out there, but it was very upsetting to see and I just felt felt this like kind of emotional response of like I guess this is it. Like we'll just see if their gamble played off um with Biden and see what happens. I just was talking to my 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 partner uh, yesterday about this idea that we have to, the DNC is pushing this idea, we have to go back to normal, which mm -hmm. is status quo, right? Which is status quo, and we have to go back to how Obama was, which was, you know, better than Trump, of course, but it's, I'm tired of the, let's, let's not be as radical as Trump, right? This idea like, okay, we you have all these, like, um, institutions we have to make sure are, like, strengthened again, and we have to all, have, get all these loopholes again to stop, you know, stop things from happening quickly like Trump did when I'm like no how about we just do the same thing but the opposite and then push progressive um you know things through faster and like screw this like kind of you know um trying to find this middle ground which I feel like that's what Obama seemed to have tried to do mm -hmm. and and even then we were he was still labeled as a radical and as this like super liberal when really he wasn't yeah. And so it's like, damn, we do, damn, we don't. So we might as well say, F it. <laughs> and just be like, I was like, hey, let's, let's pass the Green New Deal. Let's like, like screw if, like, if we have the majority. Like, let's yeah. not reach across the aisle to try to come to some consensus. We need to like radically bring the country to a more, you know, uh, a side where everybody is equal, which we are not right now. We've kind of yeah. moved way further away from that. And so I just, I'm tired of the DNC trying to say, let's go back to normal. I'm like, no, no, let's not go back to normal. Yeah. Let's go past normal and become more, more progressive and, and listen to the young people who are really calling out, which you're going to lose if you keep pandering to the elderly <laughs> in reality. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because like in that kind of sense, it's almost as if, and I've heard this other people say this, but it's almost as if the DNC is the one that's truly running on a make America great again. AKA the Obama <laughs> Obama times, right? Yeah. Let's bring it back to when it was well, great. When the, it was no, great, it's, it was it's great during build Obama. back better. This <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean that's basically it, ah, build back better. Right. Right. It, well, okay, so given that we can see there's a lot of frustrations and people are, are definitely annoyed, uh people, uh specifically activists in uh in Washington have uh been protesting against uh Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, he's become the first person with a net worth of $200 billion. Uh, following this report, protesters led by former Amazon employee Chris Smalls protested outside of Bezos' Washington home. Protesters erected a mock guillotine and opened demand for higher wages or else shutting it all down. Uh, according to an article titled American Capitalism is Off the Rails, Bezos is now worth $200 Billion as millions struggle to afford essentials by Brett Wilkin at commondreams.org. Quote, Smalls told the gathered crowd about his own employment history at Amazon and accused the company of not doing enough to protect its workers during the coronavirus pandemic. Smalls was fired shortly after helping to organize a work stoppage at the company's Staten Island warehouse over a lack of protective gear and hazard pay during the deadly outbreak. David Zapowski Amazon's general counsel then told Bezos and other company executives that public relations efforts should focus on smearing Smalls, who was described as, quote, not smart or, at or articulate. Amazon employees like Smalls have been increasingly vocal about improving pay and working conditions, especially during the pandemic, during which numerous Amazon workers have died. It's not only warehouse workers who are speaking and walking out. In May, Tim Bray, a well-known senior engineer and vice president resigned in, quote, dismay over what he called the chicken shit move of firing whistleblowers who are making noise about warehouse employees frightened of COVID-19. You do something. You do something. And I don't know about y'all, but there's no way in hell we gonna let this moment pass. 
No way. Hey, Jeff Bezos, I'm going to let you know something today. We are just getting started, and we're going to go to every single location you've got all across this country and set up shop until you be our demands as work. Lastly, if we don't get it, we shut it down. If we don't get it, shut it down. So people are hitting the streets, not just against police brutality, but like uh, the massive income uh, disparity and equity um, all tied together uh, in this, you know, intersections of oppression. This also kind of like uh, it, my feelings about this are similar to that of, of the RNC in the election, which is it feels very much like everyone is sort of dug in the trenches for their, for their side because of you know this pandemic is not it it didn't start with 2020 the devastation of the pandemic as it pertains to how it's affected us americans it's not didn't start because of 2020 it didn't start because of covid-19 it the it all of these fires are exacerbated by COVID-19, but they uh, have always existed. This disparity, like this uh, individual being able to obtain even more wealth while others um, are losing their homes is like a trend that I feel like is only going to continue to happen. And it's, again, it's like, if you don't want the guillotine, you should probably try harder to make sure that your money is uh, helping people instead of just hoarding it, you have more than you would ever need to spend at this point in time. You're sort of just fighting so that way when the world does end and we are, you know, blown up by our own incompetence, that you're the last one standing. Like, that's kind of like, it's like, I just want to be the last one standing at this point. I know it's going to blow up, but I just want to be the last one to be blown up. Like, that's that that's what it seems because you it's the argument has been laid out for why this is immoral how this is especially and during a pandemic how this is just not right um and no one is listening or they have listened and they just decided i'm i disagree or i'm not going to care and so i don't really know what else to say about it it's just it it's this it's a frustrating moment to be in where you realize that if i actually try to engage in a conversation with this person i'm probably going to look like the asshole because reason is not um not on the table in this discussion does that make sense i don't know like like empathy and compassion is like empathy saying, yeah like this is it's really unethical to hoard that much for anybody to hoard that much money um and we have a system that nurtures that it nurtures kind of the worst of human capacities yeah um i can't i i'm like uh i i don't know how um like i just don't know how you well i can't fathom having that much money but i can't fathom having that much money and feeling like i needed more and uh looking around me and going online and seeing countless articles of people struggling and suffering in ways that I could very easily fix and just go, well, that sucks for them. Like, I just cannot wrap my head around that type of, uh, like mentality. I, just, I can't, I can't like picture what that's like. I just, I don't know how you would do that. I don't know how you would be able to just sit around and ignore it or come. I mean, like you wouldn't even have to give away all of his money, not even half of it in order to have a substantial impact. It doesn't, it really doesn't make any sense. And it's just, yeah. I mean, it's all, I think it doesn't make sense, but it does for a lot of people because of the narratives our country is built on, right? It's mm -hmm. the narrative of pull yourself by your bootstraps and even, even religiously, right? Because you see, it's, you have these people who believe in the Bible, right? And Jesus talks a lot about 
you know, helping the poor, the le you treat the least of these, you treat me. And these are the same people who vote for Trump who is, you know, like not helping the poor or are, you know, supportive of these tax breaks for the wealthy. And they are angry at like food stamps and all these other like um, social services. But the same yeah. time they say they're Christian. But I think it's because of this. And I think Christianity plays a part too in a sense of, you know, you look at Christianity, there's a heaven and a hell, right? And in, in Christian, and I, I'm Protestant, um, grew up Protestant, then became Mormon. But for me, when, when you see these, this ideology of Christianity, people earn their way to go to heaven, right? In a way, like you have to be good, you have to do all these things. And if you do these good things, you will be blessed. Not only in heaven, but you'll be blessed with wealth here. And so they've kind of in their mind done this gymnastics. Where, okay, so if Bezos has money or Trump has money, or whoever has all this money, that's because they're righteous, that that's because they're keeping the whatever commandments, they're being good people. And if you're poor and you're homeless, that means you must be bad, right? They're yeah. like, that's, that's that, that's that gymnastics. And that's where people who can be really good people in one way also be pretty crappy and not care about the poor and not care about these um, social services and not, you know, and not seeing it for what they really are, which is, a key component helping the community and that if we could just invest more in these programs that we could help everyone just be able to live, just to have a whole a roof over their head, just to be able to feed their children, just the basics. And we don't, we can't even do that. And so I think it just drives down to people believing in these narratives that they've been fed, whether it be through the educational system, through movies, or even through religion, right? Because all those things all work together hand in hand to form mm -hmm. this kind of web web of um white supremacy right web of ideas that tell you tell every american that if you're wealthy you earned it and all these people who are complaining they didn't you know they didn't haven't worked hard they're not working you know 80 hours so you deserve this money mm -hmm. and if you want to give it away that's fine on you but nobody should be able to take it from you and that's why everybody gets all up in arms right with taxes that you're you know you're taking this hard-earned money from these rich people it's like, yeah. but they forget, you know, it's all interconnected. From indigenous perspective, all of this is, it's like Mother Earth, right? Everything has a place. And so yeah. someone might have, all, might have all the money, but all the, all the little pieces, all the parts of people who help make that money for Bezos, it isn't recognized, right? And on Mother Earth, same thing. Like you have the, the mountains that feed into the streams, that feed down to the ocean, and all the animals live off of this stream. And everything all interacts and we, you know, indigenous people understood that interaction and that idea of, um, of this giving back to each other, that we all interconnected. And if one person hurts, we all hurt. But I think in this American Western version of ideology of life, it's the opposite, right? It's not, we're not interconnected. We're all independent people. And if we are, if we're successful, that's on us and everybody else is, it's on them that it's not my fault. And so it takes the blame and the, the community really out of, out of society when you do that. Yeah, that's really well said. Um, so it, it's almost like a continuation of like the col colonizer and imperialist like mindset, but now like, I wouldn't say now, but always has like in a sense, like pervading kind of like every dimension and into like everybody. Yeah. Do you think also, I'm, I'm curious too, like, because uh, while you were talking about like uh, heaven and hell and like um, here on earth, like there's rich people and there's almost like a divine right to basically like they weren't, they didn't have idle hands, you know, so it's not the devil's work. Mm. It was their own doing. Like, I'm curious about like heaven, like making like a heaven on earth. I don't know if, if there's like ties to, like, I, I don't know if that's like a, something that has been like pushed or like is seen like i'm curious if under like this colonizer like capitalist like mindset you could one could still like do the gymnastics and be like yes it's like heaven on earth look look around you but then i i don't know i'm curious if anybody or y'all have like heard of like that there i don't know maybe that's more of like a yeah i mean have you folks heard about the prosperity gospel mm -mm. So yeah, if you look it up, there's actually a whole um, Netflix documentary on it, but um, it looks at there's these pastors who have used the idea of prosperity or wealth as a 
as a signal of of righteousness. So they'll they'll mm-hmm. preach to their their um people, you know, their followers that um if you just pray to Jesus for money, he'll give you money. Pray to God for for wealth, and he'll give you that great job. Meanwhile, so it's like it's, asking for money, right? Right. So it's like God has become a genie almost, you know, in these in these sectors of you know of religion and so that's that's actually a thing that's the wealth they call it the wealth um prosperity doctrine and so it all goes with the idea of like you know you're supposed to be like god if god if you're keeping the commandments god will bless you in this life that pain and all like even sickness not only money but sickness as well will go away so there are people who feel that right. if they're righteous enough they'll be healed right they won't have cancer or if they have some kind of, you know, bad disease, they'll be healed, which is why I think maybe COVID too, right? I think a lot of Christians who don't wear masks for those who don't believe that because I'm good, that God will protect me from COVID. Yeah. And if someone dies from COVID, then they must have been unrighteous or they must not have, you know, done, been a good person, right? Yeah, they're a, they're a sinner. Interesting. I, I remember that there's a QAnon uh, thing about how the masks themselves um the wearing a mask is like putting satan over your face <laughs> something like that right huh. Huh. Um, that's that, that's interesting because like i this is totally like not related but like whenever i'm like in a swimming pool i try to save bees that are drowning because i want to cash in on my bee karma and not get stung <laughs> so like i don't know so uh, yeah <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, that's really fascinating. I'm, I'm curious about that. Um, yeah, that element same. of like capitalism and and ideology and religion and so forth. Um, uh, to kind of like move it along here, um, there's a lot of stuff happening in sports. The women's national basketball association. The, Association, the WNBA, was it a specific team that um, did the protest uh, where they had uh, shirt? They wore shirts with the letters spelling out Jacob Blake's, and on the back was the like bullet holes. Um, I think it was just one team. The NBA has also been doing. Uh, there's also been strikes and other stuff going on. Um, Coed, maybe you can uh, catch us up to speed on this. Okay, so um, this is based on uh, reporting from ESPN and um, from uh, a podcast I listened to through um, Bill Simmons called uh, Higher Learning. And so based on their reporting, uh, it started on Wednesday, I believe, um, in regards to Milwaukee Bucks, which is um, important because that's the team where uh, is located where um, the shooting happened in regards to yeah, I'm not sure what team it was, though. And so that's a big reason why they felt the need to do something about it. And so interesting thing about it is that the players weren't, it was kind of a whim. That, and the reason why I say that is that reporters were saying that the players were actually dressed up and ready to play an hour before the game. And all of a sudden, there was a commotion in the locker room. One of the players started speaking out about what were they doing and questioning their them playing at all, especially after the the shooting of the te- the teenager doing the shooting of the two um, the two protesters, and so even more so, um, there was this kind of angst in the locker room, and supposedly this player got everyone to jump on board in uh, boycotting that game, and it just happened in a whim like that. They didn't tell the other team, so the other team was warming up, and so the other team didn't find out till after the Milwaukee Bucks left. And so they were kind of caught off guard. And so they're like, oh, we're leaving too then. You know, like I think, you know, they wanted to support the Milwaukee Bucks and they left. And then every other team that was getting ready for their game were surprised too. And so they all ended up deciding to leave. And then the NBA jumped in. So instead of people forfeiting, the NBA say we're just canceling games for today and tomorrow. And so um, everything was just, you know, like a breakneck speed movement in regards to what is happening. Because you can imagine all oh, NBA is a business, right? So everybody's freaking out. <laughs> Everybody's like, oh no, all the, you know, the money. And so they immediately have a big players meeting at eight o'clock, I think. So it happened around two and then eight at eight at night at a players meeting. And from what reporters have said in that meeting, there was a lot of content, con, um, anger and contention amongst the players. 
mm-hmm. because some were angry that Milwaukee did what they did without informing everybody else, without everyone being on the same page. And so they wanted to be in the know, right? They wanted to make sure it was a united front. And it just seemed like it was, it didn't look like it from, from a viewer's perspective. And there are some big, um, like LeBron James and other big time players asked Milwaukee Bucks, asked the team, what is the goal? And they wanted to know if there was a goal, like what's the end game? And they didn't have any answers. And so there was even more contention about like, what the hell are we doing then? Like, you know, like you can't just do this without goals in mind, without what you, you know, what are your demands? They didn't have any demands. It just was acting out on emotion, right? That they felt so horrible was happening in Kenosha and they just wanted to show their disgust by, by boycotting. And so they didn't, even, and, and just to add to it too, they didn't just do that, but during that same day, they met with their owner, who's actually a Democrat and is a donor. He, he was actually going to try to hold the DNC convention in their gym, I think it was, their stadium in Milwaukee. Mm. But they asked him to call the governor, lieutenant governor of that state to demand what's happening and to demand them, you know, for, for this investigation to go quickly and to not, you know, not, um, not have it drag. And so the players actually got to talk to the lieutenant governor and the governor. They got him on the phone immediately. The owners got him on the phone immediately. Again, nice. the power of money, right? Yeah. <laughs> like these billionaires are like, <laughs> yeah, we'll get the governor right now. We're calling a straight line. And so yeah. they called them. They, they discussed it. The, you know, they, they explained again the system, right? They're like, well, we, we want police reform, but a lot of the, the council members, you know, in the state are Republicans and it's hard to push things through. And, and so, but the players weren't happy with just that. And so they, they've they um, moved forward in this debate with the owners of the league, which are mostly, you know, the wealthiest men in, on, the, on the planet, really. And so they demanded from those owners that they, they won't play unless three things, were met, three things were met. So number one, I, based on the, what I've read, they wanted the owners to use their stadiums that are empty now as voting, as voting areas. They wanted it to be used as places where people could go and vote. And mm-hmm. because it's so massive, they can make it social distancing easier. And so they're encouraging all these city, all these owners to open up their um, their gyms for voting. Um, one of the things that I want to point out is that LeBron James actually has a website called More Than a Vote. I don't know if you heard about that. But it is a website that encourages um, Black Americans, really anybody, but specifically Black Americans to vote and to also understand how their vote is being suppressed by the government. And so he- Oh, that's cool. So it's educational as well as informed. Yeah. yeah. And so they, they asked the owners to donate money to that cause, more than a vote, as well as other cause, social justice causes. So that was another thing they wanted, um, as well as other things, but not everything came out in regards to what their wants. And so because of that, um, and we're talking to Obama, like it was said, um, that we're going to talk about later on. They talked to Obama as well as Michael Jordan, who's an, who's an actual um, black owner of the Charlotte, uh, the Charlotte basketball team, and they um, decided to play. But just yesterday, the Lakers, um, one of the players, LeBron James included, said that if the owners don't don't do what they say they're going to do immediately, we're going to boycott again. Like we're done. So they still, the players are still trying to hold the feet, the owners' feet to the fire to get this done, like not tomorrow, but now. And so, right. Um, so that's happening. So that's kind of the rundown of where it is now. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you for updating us on that. Our senior uh, uh, sports correspondent, Koa. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's, yeah, so that's really interesting because it's the athletes that are basically withholding their labor uh, in the form to to do a strike for uh, more you know social justice, um, and this happened just not in basketball, right? It also right. happened, I, I believe, was it baseball and soccer? So it's kind of like a sports strike wave in a sense, right? Someone called it on ESPN. Someone called it the height of power and power player empowerment. Because they were, there's even a tennis player that said she's not going to play and she actually left the tournament and yeah. And so it was something that really got people talking. But the question now is, should they have gone back to play, right? Or should they have waited? Yeah. Yeah. 
I think it's interesting uh, what you said about how they were able to, you know, get the uh, mayor on the phone. Or was it right. the governor? The governor, the lieutenant governor. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like that's that's a pretty powerful position to be in if that's sort of like when you go on strike that that's what ends up happening almost immediately. Mm -hmm. So it kind of makes me hopeful actually that that what LeBron said, like if this, if you don't, if, if you back down from what you promised us, uh, even a second too late, which is what it sounds like, then you can expect this again. And that kind of, that kind of like sort of, uh, that feels very positive to me. That feels like a, it's almost like a, it's like, um, it's like, yeah, they could keep striking, but they also did kind of win. It sounds like, and um, I don't, I don't see a reason to doubt LeBron uh, or anyone else following up on the threat of if you waver on your promises, this will happen again. I don't. So that that actually feels like a a, a wholly positive, like a, a very net positive thing to me. Actually, I still am confused yeah. about the Obama part of it a little bit, um, but. Uh, I definitely said because I uh, when 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 I first brought this up as a topic for today, I uh, just saw a lot of tweets online about how Obama, um, you know, uh, stopped another labor strike. Uh, how he, uh, you know, how he's bad for progressive values and how he's bad for uh, leftists, which is true in a lot of ways, but like specifically towards this NBA strike, like his involvement in it. Is proof that can you update our listeners like the relevance like how oh, what where did Obama play a role in this? Yeah, so like I I was just like I don't I don't know like I just saw a ton of people just immediately just being like and you know like a lot of like you know Twitter accounts with uh, hammer and sickle icons uh, in their names and stuff and you know just like uh, Republicans spend so much time bashing on Obama even though Obama has done more to help them than to help us that kind of argument. And so I was like, is that, uh, I was just wondering like, is that a valid argument for this specific situation? I know probably, I know it is for a lot of other um, issues, but I just didn't know if it was for this. Well, so just to clarify, um, so uh, from what I had read, I think what you're talking about, Lucy, is that um, LeBron, the, I believe it was like the union leader and Obama had, engaged in like a phone call or was it like a phone call with Obama and was it the whole team and it was like for advice or yeah. Yeah. It was, um, he, Le Obama had a phone call with LeBron James as well as his friend, Chris Paul, who is the head of the, um, the players union. Yeah. And so supposedly based on what reporting ESPN had, it was just, a uh, he encouraged them to play and gave them reason why they should play and how much, you know, how they could still do good in regards to social mm -hmm. justice from their from from their position in the bubble and because a lot of players from what they were saying were just believe they felt like them playing was was taking taking the media's attention away from what was happening in on the streets mm -hmm. and so a lot of players felt like if we don't play then all the attention will go back to the streets and to what's happening you know with the protests but supposedly the argument was made, I'm not sure if it's Obama, but the argument was made by someone that um, could be Obama or Michael Jordan even, that the NFL, once the NFL starts, which is way more conservative in regards to the ownership, it's most likely that people will be watching the NFL. And so, because the NFL is going to play. And so either mm -hmm. you can not play and then the NFL will play and they won't have you know, the Black Lives Matter on their on their field and all those things. It'll just be the NFL taking all the eyes off of what's happening on the street. So I think that point was made was like, you can do this, but if the NFL plays, then your voice is already mm -hmm. softened, right? Because the NFL is more popular in America than the NBA. It is, you know, the most watched sports event in the U.S. And so unless you can get the players in the NFL to strike with you, then, which is harder because NFL, they have their contract is even worse, right? There's no guaranteed contract in the NFL. So you could get hurt and you immediately, you know, you lose your contract, mm. you lose your money. I didn't oh, wow. know that. 
Yeah, yeah they have very bad. They're like that uh, in regards to the players' union for the NFL is like the worst in regards to um, the what the what rights the players do have in comparison oh, right. to the NBA. <laughs> yeah, they should. I mean, that's a, <laughs> but the, the owners wow. have so much power in that league. Yeah. Hmm. It sounds like then they have a, uh, almost more reason to strike then. Right. You'd assume, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They should. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's it, I, it's I'm making the mistake that everyone is reasonable. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. So this is something that, you know, it's still developing and will like, continue to follow up on. Um, but, yeah, I think there's some serious potential um, and success in, like, what's happened so far, what's going on, and some potentials to, like, where this might... Um, continue uh on with what it leads to um yeah any any closing thoughts from anybody before we kind of wrap up this weekly warp episode i have a quick thought just to go on in regards to that that, that uh, sports story just for let uh, listeners know if you want to check it out it's called more than a vote.org you can go online and and check the website out one thing that's pretty cool about it is that um lebron and that that organization donated a hundred thousand dollars to help um, felons in Florida, who, right. as, I don't know if you folks know, but you know they, they were given the right to vote, right? Like they, they passed that, um, that law that allowed them to vote, but the Republican government decided to put a stipulation where they had to pay court fees first. Whatever court fees mm. they owed, until they paid that off, they, they can't vote. They can't register to vote. And okay. so LeBron donated $100,000 to pay off all those fees. I love so that. that as many felons or not, I won't call them felons, as many people who were, you know, once, um, once considered a felon, right. but they've done their time, have, you know, um, the right to vote, which they should have. Mm -hmm. And so that's what that organization is doing. So if you want to support that organization, I would say check that organization out um, yeah. and share it with others. If you feel like that message of voter suppression needs to be, um, known more throughout i think the u.s yeah absolutely thank you um i would also like to add that there's a lot of protests going on in portland we didn't talk about it in great detail in this episode but um it's not just in portland it's you know still nationwide the protests for against police brutality um it's still happening you know please uh look into your area for uh bail funds to help uh, the activists and supporters and uh, yeah anything else mm, I, I don't know <laughs> I feel like there's so much I don't want to get into a, <laughs> I hope that everyone is finding like small moments to, to for joy um like, it feels like it's hard to do, I think, especially, I think if you're listening to this podcast, you probably are in the same uh, doomer mentality, um, as I assume. I mean, there might be some, uh, I don't know, it's it's like every day I'm riding this wave between like, oh shit, and um, oh, well, this is nice. Uh, it's usually, you know, like small moments, like looking out, the, look out the window, just stare at a tree honestly like the small things i want i just kind of like it's like a psa just look at a tree and just look at it as a tree for a moment um uh because it's easy to forget um you know i don't know that that um it's easy to f to forget what it feels like to be alive so that's just like a small thing that sometimes i just take a moment and just I don't know. Try to remember that. Connect with that. Know what that means. I don't know. No, yeah, I think that's an important part. Like, no, go ahead. Oh, you were going to say something. Who what? No, you're good. No, I was going to say, um, I just wanted to also, if you don't know yet, Chadwick Boseman, the person, the actor that played mm -hmm. Black Panther, passed oh, away yeah. from colon cancer. Um, and I think one thing in regards to what was just um, said about finding joy, it's amazing. He had cancer since 2016 and he was able to do so much good. And I've seen so many videos of him 
you know, visiting other cancer patients without ever revealing his own, his own cancer fight. And so I think even in the, in the midst of his own health, health issues, he was able to, to reach a lot of people, which I think is, I think, um, something to strive for, for all of us, because we all will have, you know, hard times. And so how do we deal with those? You know, do we, do we reach out to others to help them in their hard times or do we succumb to it and, and kind of, you know, close off. And it's okay to sometimes do that, to close off just to, to get that mental health break. But then to remember that, you know, helping people can also make you feel good as well. And I think sometimes we forget that, that yeah. being of, in a sense, being a, of service or, or just being kind to someone it can be very small, can help you feel a little better in regards to the world because it seems like nobody cares about each other, right? You watch the news, everybody, there seems to be a lot of anger out there in the world, but if you can put a little bit of good as Chadwick Boseman seems to have done, then maybe you can, you know, be be that change, right? And yeah. help others feel feel good about themselves. Yeah, we're in this together. We are. That wraps up this uh, edition of the Weekly Warp. Um, we hope you uh, enjoyed listening to what we had to say. Of course, if you have any um, thoughts about uh, what we've talked about today or what we missed, uh, please reach out to us on Twitter. We could find us. You can find us at Public Space Travel Pod on Twitter, and then find us individually um, uh, thereafter. Um, we love to hear from you. We also have uh, a Patreon page um, that we forget to advertise, uh, which is uh, patreon.com slash public space travel. Um, uh, if you feel like doing a donation through there or just kind of like hanging out. Um, uh, and again, like just reach out to us uh, for anything. Um, uh, I, I am <laughs> sorry, my. <laughs> My brain like slowed down for a minute. Um, uh, yeah, we hope you enjoyed yourselves. Uh, we hope you find again everything we just said. Just um, reach out to people. Uh, reach out to friends, families. Uh, do what you can to um, protect your health, but understand also that your health can also be um, uh, made better by uh, helping others' health. I don't know. I'm, I feel like my words are not connecting today, but in any case, thank you for joining us and uh, we'll talk to you uh, next time. Bye. <laughs>